Welcome to Family Church. We are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church, healing hurts, building relationships, and developing leaders. My name is Pastor John Mark, and I'm so excited that you decided to connect today. Right now, grab something to take notes with as we begin today's message. We honor the moms for the commitment, bringing new life into the world, and we know that parenting in general is not easy. The weight and responsibility to lead and train your children in the way of the Lord so when they're old they'll not depart from it is actually a heavy weight. And today, Cindy and I, my bride, my beautiful wife, we'd love to share a conversation with you. Yeah. You know, it's always kind of hard, right? Like, do you buy your wife a Mother's Day gift? She's not your mom. Absolutely. You got your husband brainwashed, don't you? You, you got to buy gifts through your kids, I guess that's how it goes. But we want to have a conversation with you today about Mother's Day. Bring some hope, lift your spirits. Dads, husbands, singles, you'll get a lot out of this as well. Hopefully give you some kind of a roadmap for the future. But before we start, let's go ahead and pray. Father, we thank you and praise you for this time that we get into your word. We ask you to open the eyes of our understanding, enlighten us to your truth, show us things to come, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. As we start this conversation, I do have a disclaimer. I've never been a mom. <laughs> Hard to believe, I know, but I have not. I do have three kids. I have a, two adults, a 21-year-old, a 19-year-old, and then my son is 11, about to be in junior high, scary times, if you've ever raised some kids through those times. But there are times when Cindy was away that I had to do double duty. I had to be both mom and dad while she was away. And let me say, that crap's not easy. <laughs> it's not easy. Um, I actually thought I would be a much better parent to young kids than I am. I didn't realize that I have a severe gag reflex when it comes to changing diapers. Um, I, I couldn't do it. I, try, I tried my hardest. I prayed. I asked for a special anointing from God. And there was this one time she was away, and uh, our oldest was just a baby, and she's like, here you go. I'm out. Going to go out with the girls. I don't even know where you're going, honestly. That's so traumatic. It's like know. scarred me for life. <laughs> but that night, my oldest decided to, you know, mess her diaper three times. Three times. And... Uh, First round, I was gagging, vomiting, cussing, <laughs> not at her, at myself. I even took one of her dresses out of her dresser and tied it around my face so I didn't have to smell it. Anybody else have a gag? Am I the only person in this room? Okay, some of y'all know. So that child got three baths that night <laughs> with the high-pressure washer, just spray it all down. Got to do what you got to do. So I wasn't that great at the baby scene, the baby thing. And society is ever-changing in its expectations of what ideal motherhood should look like. And that can be exhausting, especially to women who feel like she's fighting her own uphill battle, that she already has her own things that she's working on in and of herself. And how do I raise children in the way of the Lord when... There's things with me that are still wrong and I'm still working on. And while we love celebrating Mother's Day, for some people, today can be a really tough day. Yeah. It can be a really tough time. There may be mothers in waiting. See one on the front row here. Mothers in waiting, right? You're about to have a baby and the, the, the mystery and the unexpectedness of what that's going to look like. Maybe women who have experienced infertility or have had a miscarriage or others who are still praying to God to bless them with a godly husband and a family. Some may be grieving the loss of a mother or a child, and some may be feeling that they're failing at motherhood altogether. As we sat down and started to write this sermon about Mother's Day, I found a story in the book of Samuel that I think we can kind of relate to this story. We can pull some truths from this as we look at mothers today. 1 Samuel 1 one through eight, and I've already tried to tell this story first service, and I butchered every name. So my wife is an English and communications major. She will say the names. <laughs> Put the pressure on you. Great, thanks. And take it off myself. It's Mother's Day after all. Okay. 
Okay. There was a certain man. What's the Hebrew names, though? What? The Hebrew names. So same in Spanish. <laughs> there was a certain man from? Ramathium. Okay. A. <laughs> from the hill country of? Ephraim. Oh, she went Puerto Rican up in there. <laughs> Ephraim. For everybody else, Ephraim. <laughs> whose name was? Elkanah. Son of? <laughs> Jeroham. The son of Elihu. The son of <laughs> the son of Zuf, an Ephra Ephraimite. An Ephraimite. <laughs> he had two wives, one called Hannah and the other called Penina. Benil. <laughs> Benil. <laughs> Penini had two children. <laughs> but Hannah had none. Three years after, I'm sorry, year after year, this man went up from the town and worshiped and sacrificed the Lord Almighty at Shiloh, where Hophni and Phineas, Phineas and Ferb, the two <laughs> sons of Eli, were priests of the Lord. Whenever that day came, Elkanah, for him to serve the sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to his wife, Penina, and to all her sons and daughters. But Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her, and the Lord had closed her womb. What a tragic place to be in when you feel that God is not for you, but in fact, he's against you. Right? Feeling the Lord had closed her womb because the Lord had closed her womb. Her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. This went on year after year. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she wept and would not eat. Now, one thing we know is that this was not a New York Puerto Rican lady right here. A New Yorican ain't going to put up with this. Provoking her to anger, she's going to pull out the cuchillo. Come on, somebody. She's going to pull out the knife. She's going to threaten her life. She's not going to go in the corner and start crying because someone's <laughs> bullying her, right? So her husband asked her, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? <laughs> this is such a guy statement. Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? Uh, no. No. No, you don't. Because what he's not understanding and what many of us maybe don't understand is the time frame in which this setting was, it was a problem if you could not have children. Yeah. You did not fit the social norm. And it can be difficult if you don't fit the social norm. I can remember my sister got married a little bit later in life and all the McKelveys and all the family all got married at 19 years old and that was the norm. And if you didn't get married at 19 or 20, something was wrong with you. Right? And, and I think sometimes we can feel that way. What's wrong with me? How come life isn't working out the way I thought it should, on the timeline that it should? She could not bear children. This was not acceptable. She felt broken. She felt lost. And in her self-image, her poor self-image and brokenness, God still blessed her. God still blessed her. Over and above other women, she was blessed, and I think that was the reassurance of God. The reassurance of God, he's coming along and saying, yes, I understand that you don't fit whatever, but I wanna bless you. Please don't let your parenting deficiencies pull you away from the blessings of God. Yeah. Amen? Amen? Her biggest struggle, her biggest struggle was not that she couldn't have kids. Her biggest struggle was that she believed that God had closed her womb. If you go on and read the story of Hannah, she makes a promise to God. It was actually a prayer that I also prayed um, over our third pregnancy. I really wanted a son. We had lost our third child, and it, it messed me up really bad. And I was like, I'm, I'm never having any more kids again, like straight out, never doing it. Mm -hmm. yeah, but I, you know, I had this heart and this dream and this desire to have a son. Mm -hmm. And I actually prayed Hannah's prayer. I said, Lord, if you give me a son, I will give him to you. And Hannah does, the, the story works out that God does open her womb and Hannah does have a child. It's a great story. 
as she fulfills her maternal call. But that can be a tragic place to be emotionally, yeah. is thinking that God is against you. Mm -hmm. And when you follow your dream and you go out of your way to try to do something great for God and it doesn't work out, it's easy to feel that God is not for you. Yeah. It's easy to feel when you are sick and you're praying, God, heal me, and you don't see an instant miraculous healing, well, God is not for me. And that, that's the furthest thing from the truth. God is for you. He'll never be against you. And we have to believe that promise. So today, we have a few tips for you. If you're struggling with maternal identity or an unhealthy comparison uh, of success with other moms, take it away. The first tip is going to sound almost silly when I say it because it sounds like it should be easy. And it's just to be you. For some reason, this is actually one of the hardest things. Due to what we've seen in, as an example of motherhood, whether it's you know, mothers we encounter in real life, our own, grandmothers, aunts, friends or people that we see digitally, whether it's on social media and movies, we all get this idea of what motherhood should be. And so the question is, who are we? And the thing is that we're all different. You have to ask yourself these questions. Are you a big family mom or a one and done? I come from huge family. My mom's one of 12 and my dad's one of eight. Everybody has three and four kids. So for me, it was never a question that I wasn't gonna have, that I was gonna have at least three. <laughs> It was not his question. <laughs> I got my three. <laughs> my plan was a boy and a girl, right? So those kind of things need to be talked out. Mm -hmm. what, what's your dream? What's your family size? What are our yeah. hopes? Because that can be a source of contention. For sure. And then other questions are like silly ones. Do you like to craft? Do you cook? Do you bake? Do you love to be outdoors? Because if bugs freak you out, you're probably not taking your kids hiking every week. She's not taking the kids hiking I'm every week. I'm not taking the kids hiking every week. <laughs> and that's completely okay. In Psalm 139, 13, it says, For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's room. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. What that means is that everything that is innate inside of us all the things that we love, whether it's your love of the outdoors or not, <laughs> or the things that you can't wait to teach your children, they were put there by God. They're the things that make you who you are. And if you like different things than your friends or your sisters or whoever, it's not good or bad. It's just who you are. You're different. And we were all created to be different. Think about how boring it would be if we were all the same. Well, if everyone was like me... I think life would be amazing. <laughs> we would get so much done. She obviously, she's, she's being silent. That means she disagrees. <laughs> but anyways, as I was saying, he didn't create you to have all of the desires to be the same as everybody else. And because of that, I think it's important to go on to the next tip, which is don't make comparisons. He gave us those certain talents and desires, so we should be real careful to avoid the comparison trap. And humans have been falling into that trap probably from day one. You look at your neighbors and you think, oh, if only I could or if only I had. And then you look at social media, which amplifies this, 24 hours a day, you are bombarded by images of people who are doing it better than you are. You see perfect houses, Fantastic dinners, great vacations, but nobody, they may be showing you the kitchen, nobody shows you what the living room looks like. Or the closets, or the credit card debt. Yeah, like, <laughs> you see the kids looking real clean and real nicely combed, but you don't see what they look like two minutes after the pictures were taken. And a lot of times we just put that pressure on us, and you know what it makes us? It makes us exhausted and cranky. Yeah. Husbands, I'm going to give you a tip. Maybe you've already fallen into this trap. But don't ever compare your wife's cooking to your mom's cooking. We are not the same. It's like, well, the lasagna was good, but that's not the way my mom makes lasagna. You know, then that starts a little fight, a little tension. Like, you know, honey, maybe you just call my mom and get the recipe. Because you know, that's like the real way to do it. Or you can call her and she can make it for you. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
<laughs> Bro, see what I'm saying? <laughs> it's because it's Mother's Day. She can get away with that. <laughs> but it's so easy to fall into the comparison trap. And when you do that, you lose the joy yeah. of your current life. Mm -hmm. Right, like you're excited because you just went out and bought a brand new Toyota Corolla and your next door neighbor pulls in with a brand new Tesla. All of a sudden, you're not happy with your brand new purchase. Yeah. Right, it's like, oh man, they got a Tesla. I'm going to go key it. <laughs> it can be very easy to fall into this trap and lose like the moments yeah. of joy that you have in your current state, yeah. this comparison. Uh, you see your neighbors doing different things with their kids and you have to work two jobs to put food on the table and you're not doing all the activities that mm -hmm. other parents are doing. Listen, I'm telling you, it's, it's for a season. And, and our kids understand yeah. that we're providing for them and that our hearts are for them. Today, my hope is just to tell all the moms in the room, you're doing great. You're doing an amazing job. Yeah. Take the pressure off yourself. Enjoy the little wins. Enjoy the little moments, right? It, we were raising our babies and the kids would take their first steps. It was like, ah, you know, you're cheering for that first yeah. step. And then somewhere along the line, you forget the joy of the little things mm -hmm. of what it means to be a family unit growing and moving together. Galatians 6, 4, and 5. Each one should test their own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else, for each one should carry their own load. Moms, we have so much on our plate already. Just the fact of being a person, a woman, we have our own things that we deal with, our own things that we're trying to heal from, add that, the pressure of being a mom and carrying that, and then whether you have to work or not. Let's just take pride in the job that we're doing and the kids that we're raising. Who cares if we don't match social media pages? Are your kids happy? That's important. Absolutely. And I didn't say this first service, but think about it. You want to match social media, whatever, but what if your kids don't like any of that stuff? I'm going to throw a caveat in there as well. <laughs> Not everything your parents raised you with is going to work on this next generation. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. Your yep. parent, you did not like being yelled at and embarrassed by your parents. Yeah. So stop that crap. Yeah. Don't yell and embarrass your kids because mm -hmm. it ain't going to work. Right? Yeah. We, we, we got to be very careful, be slow to speak. The Bible says slow to anger. This new generation, you raise your voice and they like just melt on the floor. And you're like, what's up? Like my parents yelled at me and I yelled back. And I got slapped in the head three times. <laughs> right? I remember one time we were walking through the grocery store and one of our kids was acting up. And we did give the pow pow, occasional pow pow. I mean a spanking. We, we gave spankings growing, you know, to our kids growing up. Nothing crazy. But one day our kid was throwing a fit in the grocery store or whatever. And Cindy gave the, the Caitlin or Michaela a pow pow. And there was this lady on a shopping cart. And now she goes, now that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> it's true. And you have to realize that it's going to change from kid to kid. Michaela will hike every mountain. She's out there in her little Lululemon, like up the mountain. The other two, don't even tell them about a mountain. They don't want to know about a mountain existing. Nope. And in reverse, when the girls were little, I was the crafty mom. We had every craft imaginable. Liam could care less about a craft. <laughs> and it's okay. Like sometimes I would think to myself, like, I feel bad. I'm like neglecting Liam. I don't do all the stuff, but he don't want it. Remember when scrapbooking was a big thing, like taking pictures mm -hmm. and scrapbooking, and we don't even do that anymore. So it's like, it's on my camera roll on my phone. It's good enough. <laughs> yeah. So now if you're struggling and you're overwhelmed, it's important to just stop. And you may say stop what? Everything. Take not, a par breather. not parenting. Well, not parenting. But just take a breather. In 1 Kings, there's a story about a prophet named Elijah. He had just finished defeating a bunch of bad guys with the help of God. And the queen sends a messenger to let him know that she's going to kill him. 
Elijah gets scared and runs away. Now let's stop here for a second. He just defeated a 400, 400 prophets of Baal. 400 men. And he gets scared by a little letter that the queen sends him saying, Calls fire come. down from heaven, burns up all these people, and then gets a letter from the queen saying, before the sun sets, what you did to them, I will surely do to you. And, you know, and he, here's the struggle. The biggest part of that battle yeah. is that it was okay. He was confident and bold to outrun chariots and to call fire from heaven when he knew that his country was with him. Yeah. He could battle the enemy because the country was battling the enemy. But now his own people are turning against him. Mm -hmm. And when your own people turn against you, it can become a tragic situation, right? As a family unit, we can conquer anything that comes our way. Yeah. But when the household becomes divided and the bickering and fighting become each other, mm -hmm. right? I'm yelling at you because the dog peed on the floor. Come on, somebody, you all have done it. Your dog just pissed in the house again. Like... I didn't piss in the house. <laughs> but it can, it can, it can become, you know, this is that same story. He was yeah. conquering the world, but now his queen is out to kill him. Yeah. And he, the Bible says that he runs for his life. Mm -hmm. He runs away. He starts praying to God, whining to God, really. He's all like. I don't know if he was whining. He's all like, I'm done. Take me now. The queen is he after was, him. He just killed 500 but people. But not whining. He was whining. Anyways. Dude so, was scared, man. He falls asleep, and when he wakes up, an angel of the Lord brings him some food and water, and then he falls asleep again. The second time he wakes up, the angel reappears, feeds him again. He falls asleep again. But guess what happened the next morning? He wakes up, and this time he was strengthened and able to travel the 40 days to the mountain of God. What is, why do I tell you this story? Because that's your favorite story, and you like that God fed him. Because I want you to not underestimate the power of a nap and a snack. <laughs> that's the deepest theological tip you're going to get all day. Don't underestimate the power of a nap and a snack. You, on the days when you're feeling overwhelmed, not good enough, just stop, reset, and start over. And we said earlier, even the Lord felt the need to remove himself to pray and get himself, you know, in the front, right frame of mind. Yeah. And we have to do it as well. Yeah, anytime Jesus was put in a situation where he had to make a tough decision or something big was about to happen, you always saw that he went away... He removed himself from the crowd. He removed himself from the busyness. He removed himself from the strife. Yeah. And he sought the Lord. He prayed. He mm -hmm. took that time to refresh. Even in the Garden of Gethsemane before he was going to be crucified, he kneels down. He begins to pray. Tough prayer. So, such a strong prayer that he's sweating blood. He says, Lord, if there's any way this cup can pass for me, I'm going through this. I'm, I'm, I'm in it deep. He, and then he surrenders. He says, not my will, but your will be done. And the next verse is so important. It says, and then the angels of the Lord came and ministered strength to him. Yeah. Right? It's so hard when you're trying to not remove yourself and just keep fighting and just keep moving. It's very hard to hear the voice of God in the busyness. Yeah. Take that time to remove yourself from the situation. Remove yourself from the chaos. Don't yell. Don't get crazy at your kids. Reset, mm -hmm. recharge, come back and give your kids options. And you say something like, okay, here's what's going to happen. You can either have A or B. Mm -hmm. now, you're giving them the choice. You're giving them the power to make a decision, yeah. but it's limited decision. Right? The, you're going to do exactly what I say. Well, maybe there could be a little bit of margin there. Maybe there could be a little bit of room. Here's the two options you get to choose. Yeah. And if you don't like these two choices, then you go without it's still the choice, right? Putting it back in their hands. One thing that we need to work on in our, in our lives and as moms and dads is operating in love. Yeah. Operating in love. Mm -hmm. Emotions can run high in stressful situations. Yeah. 
And anger can be the forefront of our response instead of responding to each other in love. I was raised Pentecostal, and if you look at our vision statement of our church, it says we are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church. Spirit-filled basically means that we believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. Mm -hmm. uh, I pray in tongues every day. I'm not against it. I'm for it. But my theology about it has changed over the years. We used to believe that speaking in tongues was the initial evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and I no longer believe that. I believe that the initial evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, yeah. kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. Yeah. Against such there is no law. Because I have met some Pentecostals who are just the nastiest human beings you ever want to meet. Oh, they can pray in tongues all day long, but they have not love. Yeah. And Paul says, if I can speak in tongues of angels and of men, but have not love, I have nothing. Yeah. I am of clanging brass and of cymbal. Mm -hmm. It's just noise, right? But when we operate in love, when we operate in joy, when we operate in peace, we are demonstrating the spirit-filled life and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Amen? So here's the balance. How do I balance the whirlwind of my everyday life? having a career, having a family, having finances, meeting the needs of my husband, and be this parent, raising children, and still operate in love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness. That's the cross to bear. That's the human condition. That's the struggle that we work through every day. Yeah. And I think it's important to let your kids know. Like, when I'm feeling overwhelmed, I'll tell my kids, I need a moment. Like, I need you to remove yourself, or I'm going to remove myself, because I need a moment. Not only does it show them that you're human, and that you're taking responsibility for your own emotions in that moment, but kids have big emotions, and they don't know how to deal with them. And it shows them that they also have the authority to take a step back and get themselves regulated before they go on. And honestly, parents, apologize. Your kids need to hear it, because we come out of pocket all the time. Our parents were from a generation that apologies weren't necessary. They didn't apologize. It's just, you don't hear it. But you know what? We need it. We needed to hear it. And when you apologize to your kids, they learn to apologize. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's not an easy thing, right? If you weren't raised in a home that apologized. Apologizing is not, you know, surrendering or losing the argument or losing yep. the fight. Apology is restoration of the relationship. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry for how that conversation went. Yeah. I'm sorry that I raised my voice, mm -hmm. right? I might have still been right. Yeah. And I still may hold to the fact that my viewpoint was right. And she may still hold to her viewpoint was right. Mm -hmm. But how we went about that disagreement was yeah. wrong, right? And so what we've learned, because, I mean, listen, I'm Irish, she's Puerto Rican, we fought. We fought. I think she swung a frying pan at me one time. I, did that. I think she swung a chancleta at me one time. You know what's up. When that slipper comes off, come on, somebody. She's definitely punched me in the face before. I have. <laughs> but I liked it. <laughs> what we... What, <laughs> What we've learned is that a disagreement needs to lead to a resolution. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're arguing because we're two individuals trying to work life together in the same direction towards the same goals. Yeah. So it was so easy in the beginning. I, I watched, you know, my parents fight. She watched her parents fight. And the whole point of a disagreement was to win. Mm -hmm. Was like shut the other person up and to like let them know like I won this argument. And many times you do that by digging up the past. Well, five years ago, you never, you always, right? Start throwing those statements around. You've lost, the fight's over, like it's lost. All we're doing now is creating injuries. Yeah. And injuries are not the point to a relationship. Mm -hmm. Reaching our goals, our dreams, our desires, that's what the union is about. That's what the goal of the relationship is about. Yeah. 
So coming and fighting or disagreeing in a way that says, okay, let's argue this out in a way that pushes us towards that goal and we find resolution. Because I don't know about you, but I hate having the same fight over and over again. We're arguing about the same thing. Why do you take the whole pot of rice and put it in the fridge? God made Tupperware. That was a big fight we had for years. Silly. Silly fight. Come on, somebody. You know what I'm talking about. You had that same fight if you're married to a Poriqua. Well, the rice heats up better if you leave it in the Cadero. Cadero. <laughs> How, how is life moving forward? How are we reaching our goals? How are we honoring God with the relationships that we have? Let's take a moment. I want to pray for you. Father, we come to the name of Jesus. Lord, I thank you for all the mothers in the house today, the moms watching online. I pray that, Lord, you give them grace. Not just your grace because we know that's undeserved and it's given freely. But I pray that we would have grace for ourselves. Grace upon ourselves to forgive ourselves, and to dream dreams bigger than what we've seen in the past. That your mercies are new every morning and we can rest in that fact. Help us to be ourselves, the best version of ourselves. Help, help us to make wise choices for our families and be examples to our children. Help us raise them in the way of the Lord so when they're old, they'll not depart. And Lord, for those moms that think it's too late, that, that their kids are already out of the house. Your word says that you would renew the time, that you would renew that time and that you would bring the heart of the child back to the parent. So Father, I thank you for restoration in homes and relationships with kids. Help them to have the love of God that is shed abroad in our hearts. Let us recognize that we have the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead, living and abiding on the inside of us. So help us to walk in that power and that authority. Father, I bless everyone in the sound of my voice today. They're the head and not the tail, above and never beneath. Everything they set their hands to would prosper and be successful in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. My name is Pastor John Mark, and I'm so glad we were able to connect together today. If this impacted you in any way, I need you to do a few things for me. I need you to like and subscribe to this channel and head over to FamilyChurchNY.com to take your next steps.